This video is a follow-up to a documentary I just released on my main channel, GBay99, a big documentary about an hour long on the history of the rise and fall of the Jyn Air Green Wings. And this documentary is, it's, it was one of the strangest experiences I had in making a video, and I kind of have a lot to talk about in relation to how everything came about. And I'd like to share that with you guys in this making of series. So this series is gonna be split into two parts. This first part that you're watching right now is going to talk a little bit about the conceptual stage of how I came to decide on making a documentary on this specific team in this specific way and the sort of iterations on a conceptual level that the video went through. I'm also going to have a second part, though, that sort of shows the actual technical elements of the script writing process. I'll show you a couple of drafts of the script and the outline and that kind of stuff, the editing phases, and that will be the bonus video I put out on Patreon for anyone that pledges a dollar or more that will be the bonus video for this month. Anyway though, I kind of have a lot to talk about so let's go ahead and jump right in. The idea for this video originally came about in mid-2022 when I was watching The Sopranos for the very first time ever. I'd seen Mad Men, I, I love a lot of stuff from the golden age of television, but I had never gone back and watched The Sopranos. So I was doing that with my fiance and of course loved it like everybody does, but of all the great episodes and characters and scenes in The Sopranos, my favorite was in season one, episode nine, The Ballad of Tennessee Multisanti Williams, I think the name was. And it's a scene where one of the main characters, Christopher Multisanti, with which if you have not seen the show, he's an Italian, New Jersey, Italian mafioso in the mafia, the New Jersey mob, and he is taking up this sort of side project trying to be a screenwriter. He's fallen in love with screenwriting and movie making, and he is in his apartment trying to write a script for a screenplay, and he is struggling. He's dealing with writer's block, and it's making him depressed. So he is just, he's throwing a fit, he's having a little pity party, and one of his mafia associates Polly comes in and, and finds him all depressed and he says what's wrong with you what, what what's going on kid and they have a, a very great back and forth that I think is maybe the best scene in the show at least in my opinion but anyway in that back and forth there's a very interesting line where Christopher says to Polly you ever feel like nothing good was ever going to happen to you and Polly says yeah and nothing did so what? That scene and that line, that back and forth, is one of the most brilliant things I think I've ever seen in any show. TV. Like, that perfectly encapsulates life. You know, like, you feel like nothing good's ever going to happen to you, but that's just life, right? And I feel like that that was such a brilliant moment, and, and as I said, my favorite scene in the show, that I kind of thought, I wonder if I can make that into a documentary. I wonder if I can sandwich a documentary with those two clips. I, I've seen a couple of people do this in YouTube documentaries where they'll make a documentary on a subject and they'll they'll have a clip from a movie or TV show or something at the beginning and maybe beginning and end that is relevant to the subject. M. Lemon, who did a documentary on the history of the first person to ever climb Mount Everest, for example, he included a clip from The Ballad of Ricky Bobby, Talladega Nights, that just starts at the very beginning of it with um, a character saying, remember, if you aren't first, you're last. And, you know, it's like a two second clip that starts off a documentary that's all about <laughs> who was the first person to climb Mount Everest. And it's a, you know, it's a great little tone setter and a great little, it sets the tone. That's what it is. It's a tone setter. And I've always wanted to do something similar in my own documentary. And, and when I saw that clip from The Sopranos, I thought, I can, I can use that as, as something to sandwich a documentary beginning and end with those two clips. And... That was the idea for this documentary. It was originally gonna be a very short piece, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes at most. And I just thought, who is the player or team in League of Legends that nothing good ever happened to them? I came up with two answers. The first answer was the Jyn Air Green Wings. They seemed like the team that nothing good ever happened to them. They were around League of Legends for a long enough period of time that they have a lot of history to go through, but they, you know, they weren't just in LCS for one split before getting relegated. They were around for a long time. And they, you know, never really got to experience a lot of major exciting happiness or major successes. They never won an LCK title or world championship or anything along those lines. So they seemed like the team, but I, I was also playing around with, with <laughs> doing it on a player. And I thought, Ryu, 
he might be the player that nothing good ever happened to him. He, of course, was the player on the losing end of the Faker Z versus Z outplay. Faker, what was that? You know, that that was maybe the most famous outplay in League of Legends history, and he was the player on the losing end of it. So I thought, maybe I could do this on Ryu. And, and, you know, I've always had a fascination with making videos or documentaries or telling stories about people in sport who don't get to win because that's kind of what is, is most interesting about sport to me is that in the world of competition, there's only one world champion at the end of the year. There's only one team out of the 32 in the NFL that gets to win the Super Bowl. And for most most teams, most players, the experience of playing a sport competitively is working non-stop on trying to hone your craft and try to be the best you can possibly be and then failing. That is the majority of a professional athlete's existence. And it's really interesting and sad to think about. And it kind of encapsulates life very well. It's a mirror of life, I think. And I'm, I've always been interested in telling those sorts of stories. So I was really excited at doing this, but I, I was... I was struggling between should it be Jin Air and should it be Ryu, and I ended up saying, you know what, it would be too mean to do a documentary explicitly on Ryu saying nothing good ever happened to him because he was a great talent. Um, so I eventually said, you know what, let's do it on Jin Air. Now, as I said, I've always had a fascination with these kinds of stories, and I think that they are a really, really interesting sort of perspective to look at at sport. You know, I've never done a documentary on Faker or Bjergsen. I'm much more interested in the people like Khan who, you know, they lose their last ever game or, or they come up short in a major way and seeing the humanity that, that comes out in those sort of experiences. But that being said, Jin Air does not have a lot of history that is readily available online. When I was looking through, you know, the Jin Air Leaguepedia page, there is very little in terms of like trivia or interesting details and factoids about their team. There's not a lot of great info out there on like fun stories or fun pieces of history that I can point to and talk about. And so I was really worried about how th that's part of why I thought this was going to be like a 10 minute video. It was going to be a short little thing to tie viewers over in between larger documentaries. But then I saw that H-Dragon, Han Song Young, was the coach for Jin Air basically their entire existence. And I thought, oh, okay, here's a person who um, he might be able to be a main character, as it were. And I looked at his Leakpedia page. There is nothing on there. There is no <laughs> information, no details. So I eventually started looking around Korean Wikipedia sites. Like I searched his Korean name and was using Google Translate to try and find some interesting factoids about him. So eventually I saw, oh, he was a former professional kickboxer. Okay, that's interesting. That can be where we start this documentary. And then I, I start looking and, and um, seeing that, oh, he was a StarCraft coach before he was a league coach. That is really interesting. Maybe there's some history there. And then the thing that really kicked this documentary off for me was when I saw that he was the coach at Hwasong Oz. Because I don't know if any of you guys have watched this, but the first ever esports documentary I ever watched was in 2013 a StarCraft documentary called State of Play. I remember this came out very early, like I was just getting into esports. I just started playing League of Legends. I had previously been playing StarCraft 2 and I was like wanting to become a pro player myself and I was consuming all the kind of pro content I could. And this documentary came out by a Belgian filmmaker, if I remember correctly, where it was a documentary on Jadong and Hua Song Oz that eventually followed the blow up of Jadong's team when the match fix scandal of 2011 hit and then he joins teammate and and uh there's also some parallel stories of kids in the amateur scene and kids who are trying to break into the amateur scene and and whatnot uh there, there's also like a fan that's profiled and it's it's kind of meant to document the whole um ecosystem of professional starcraft in the late 2010s and i watched this documentary like five times <laughs> when i was when it was 2013 however old i was at the time so when i saw that han was the coach of Hua Song Oz, and then I went back and I rewatched the documentary and I saw him in all of these different scenes. That's when this really clicked for me and I realized, holy moly, this could be a really good documentary. Here's a coach that was not only involved in Professional League of Legends for an extended period of time, who I was also starting to learn, scouted Mystic, scouted Teddy, scouted all of these great players that went on to have long, successful careers. Not only was he a pretty big, influential person in terms of competitive League of Legends, 
but he was also the coach of Jadong. He was in the this documentary as a side character of, of one of the most important moments that has happened in esports history, coaching one of the greatest players in esports history. I would say Jadong is maybe the second greatest StarCraft Brood War player of all time. I know that might be... Um, blasphemous to put him above Bonjois, but I, I would say he's probably only the only person better than him would be Flash. He was the scout and coach and developer of one of the greatest StarCraft Brood War players of all time. He scouted and developed all of these great League of Legends players. And then as I started reading through interviews he gave to Inven and a number of other articles that mentioned him, I saw I constantly saw him popping up as this important character throughout esports history. And then I saw that he was the scout and coach and person who convinced Rogue not to quit, who then Rogue went on to become arguably the greatest StarCraft 2 player of all time. And I was shocked like holy moly it was unbelievable to me this guy was maybe the most influential individual in esports history spanning three separate titles and nobody has ever heard of his name and actually all of this reminded me of a book that i read i think two years ago unfortunately i don't think i have it with me right now I, it, it must still be up in cincinnati but i read a book a number of years ago that was called the Man on Whom Nothing Was Lost, where I picked up this book kind of on accident. I was just looking for something to read, and I, I was interested in foreign policy at the time, and I, I saw this book recommended in some sort of list. But anyway, it ended up being a very interesting and enlightening book. Uh, anyway, to give a brief summary, I guess, it's a book that's on the history and life and times of a person uh, named Charlie Hill, who currently is a professor at Yale that teaches this apparently legendary course called Grand Strategy that all the student, students at Yale know of. But before he was a professor, he worked in the foreign service as like a diplomat, um, essentially, uh, as well as he worked for, as a speechwriter for a number of presidents, as is my understanding, and, and kind of worked in the background on, on a number of different important political figures, staffs. And he... A lot of people like credit him as being the person that is either responsible for or savior of like all of these important moments of history. It kind of depends on your politics. He he mostly worked in a number of conservative governments, and some people like really hate him and say that he's responsible for like the Israel Palestine conflict, or that they really praise him and say he's why there wasn't a war here or there. And he like all of these important moments from history, from the Vietnam War to. I mean, basically everything in the 80s, like he was in the background working with presidents like as a speechwriter. And it was a really interesting profile piece that was done from the perspective of a student that was interviewing him as as a professor. And he see, just seems like such an interesting character. I'm struggling to remember some of the details of the book and I don't want to misquote anything or get anything wrong. But the general gist of it was this interesting profile on a person that you haven't heard of, but who, who has almost certainly affected your life. And that, that's one idea that, that I really came across with that book that, that was really interesting, is that oftentimes the people that really influence history or have these important moments that you know affect all of our lives, it's not the president that does the, the thing that you love or hate. It's the speechwriter and the staff member that writes up the bill and, you know, talks and has conversations with the president about how they push their agenda through Congress. Like, there's a lot of people that are very influential that you have never heard of before. And this profile on Charlie Hill was a really interesting example of that. So anyway, that idea has really stuck with me that there are some really important influential people in history that we've never known because they are, they're always there. They're always there in the background, but you don't don't notice them because they aren't the one that's giving the speech. They aren't the one that's that's in the spotlight. They're in the crowd right behind the person that's that's taking up the spotlight. And then I realized, oh my God, Han Song Yong is that for esports. He is the guy that if you go back and watch State of Play, if you go back and watch Jadong winning all of his Star Leagues, if you go back and watch Team 8 and early StarCraft 2, or you go back and watch early League of Legends history, then you will constantly see his face. He is always popping up as this important character that's influencing things, but he is, you know, either too humble to acknowledge all of the great, important, influential things he's done, or he's someone that, that you know, he's happy to just be a coach. He, he's he's working hard, and whether you notice him or not is, is up to you. And I really 
kind of became obsessed of like, oh my God, I, I really want to do this person and his story justice because he is a shockingly important, influential person in esports history. So anyway, I start working on this documentary and it starts ballooning. It starts um, realizing, okay, this might not be a 20 minute video. This might not be a 10 minute video. This might have to be a full fledged documentary. And I'm putting all these pieces together. I'm learning about Han. I'm learning about his influence in StarCraft. I'm learning about his influence with Team 8, his influence in League of Legends. And then I'm trying to think about like all the ways I can I can tie all of these individual players' stories together from Mystic and Captain Jack and Teddy and Umti and all of these players that joined Jyn Air and League of Legends and, and put them put them all together. And I keep on running into a question of, you know, Jyn Air, why are they involved in esports? <laughs> like, what's going on here? And it was a really big question that, that was kind of always nagging me in, in terms of... Um, I, I didn't know if the, like I was making this up or not, but I thought, you know, they're a budget airliner. They are owned by Korean Air, who's a big corporation, but they're a, they're a small company. Like, is there a reason why they're in esports that that's beyond the general, you know, corporate sponsorship thing? Uh, they're going up against Samsung. They're going up against LG. They're going to go up against SK and Korea Telecom. Why is this budget airliner here? And so one thing I actually feel very bad about, but I forgot to credit them at the end of the documentary, is I, I did two interviews, one with Emily Rand and one with a StarCraft historian uh, asking both of them, like, do you know, can you give me some details about uh, Jyn Air and their history? And Emily was very helpful. She was super super helpful and uh, was a, I don't know if I could have, could have made the documentary without her. And um, she showed me like an early article she wrote on Jyn Air and gave me some details about their history and, and helped me fact find a couple of stuff and fact check a few things. And then she referred me to the StarCraft historian because I asked her, do you know why Jyn Air cared so much about League of Legends? And, and she was like, no, I, I don't really know. I know they cared more about StarCraft than League. They they kind of threw money to their StarCraft division than League of Legends, but I, I don't necessarily know why, they, why they're involved in League. Uh, she said, but talk to this guy. He, he might be able to give you an answer. And so I added this dude who, thank goodness, he allowed me to have a short conversation with him. Um, I, I forget his name. I'll, I'll put his name up on screen right now uh, because he, he was invaluable. Uh, Wax Angel. That, that was his name. Uh, Wax Angel. And I said, do you know why Jyn Air cared so much about esports? Like, why is this budget airliner involved in competitive gaming? And he said... Just look up Emily Cho, or her, her, she goes by Emily Cho in English circles, but she has a Korean name, of course. He said, look, look this name up. And then I started seeing, <laughs> there's not a lot on the internet about her in English, but there are so many articles about the Cho family, about all of these different scandals, about the nut rage incident. And then I started learning that Emily was a diehard esports fan. I found an old interview she did with Team Liquid, or not Team Liquid, but Liquidpedia, uh, talking about why she sponsored all these important StarCraft events that she talked about. Like she was the one that wanted to get Jin Air and Korean Air involved in esports and was doing all these different things to support the scene. And she suddenly became like main character number two. I was so fascinated with her. Like to me, I know a lot of people in Korea, and there was even a comment on Reddit that pointed this out. Like a lot of people in Korea hate the Cho family because Che Bowls, the, the big companies that are owned by families in Korea, like Samsung and SK and Korea Telecom and, and all these different companies, they're they're kind of going through a bit of a revelation in Korea right now because all of these people and all these families have kind of gotten to break all the rules and never face consequences. And, and it's for the, maybe the first time in Korea's existence a lot of people are really fighting back at the class disparity between the, the rich and the poor. And a lot of people are really holding these families who do things like have the nut rage incident. They're trying to hold them more accountable. And so the, the Cho family has been under a lot of scrutiny over the years. And there were more stories about them, too, that I wanted to include in the documentary. There was like footage of the, the Emily's mother, like abusing all of these, like throwing a temper tantrum around all these construction workers she hired to build something for. Her. But to me, reading up on it, everything, Emily just seemed like such a sweet person. The, the big scandal she had was the flooding incident when she threw a cup of water at another executive during a marketing meeting. And from my understanding, it was like another executive, someone that was 
potentially like a peer of hers and it was like a disagreement and throwing a cup of water isn't as as bad as a hit and run like what her brother did so I don't know she seemed like the most likable of all the characters to me and she always had this obsession with Starcraft with professional gaming and Starcraft and I don't know to me it was almost like a high school musical thing like she was born into this circumstance where she was expected to live a certain kind of life and, and accomplish certain things and run the company business and all this stuff but she had this passion that that didn't jive with her expectations or that people heaped upon her and she just really wanted to be a part of esports i don't know i found her very lovable that might be partly because i'm american though and, and looking at things from a non-korean perspective i'm sure people in korea have a very different feeling about emily and and all of that whole the the whole cho family stuff but I learned about all of that stuff and I was like, okay, this is, this is a feature length documentary. I, I can't contain all this in a, a short story. And there were a number of different iterations things went through. And there was always a big question I was having in terms of like, how can I, wh what sort of visuals can I put, put to all this? Because I need to make another video about this actually, but a lot of early Korean League of Legends history is lost media after OGN shut down and privated and, and Twitch deleted all their VODs. And there's a lot of stuff that, that there's not visuals to to show. And I was trying to think, what's a creative sort of visual thing I could do for this documentary that, that kind of, you know, punctuates things in a somewhat artistic way? And the big answer I came up with was Microsoft Flight Simulator. I found someone who made a skin for a Jin airplane in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and I thought, you know what? It could be beautiful if over the course of this hour-long documentary, like while I'm telling the story of Jin Air beginning to end, I'm always including clips of a Jin Air plane. And it starts in a hangar, and then it's taking off, and then it's flying at low altitude, like 10,000 feet or whatever, and then it's flying through the clouds, and then the sun is setting, and it's flying higher and higher, and then by the end, it's like flying into the sunset, and you get this visual of a Jin Air plane taking off and eventually flying into heaven because they were too pure for this world. I thought that was a really brilliant, fun way of, of doing a creative visual for this documentary. And I don't know how well it came across because I, I didn't actually include enough Jin Airplane clips. And I, I kind of, I don't think they were all necessarily chronological too. There, there's like some where you see it at, at like, I don't know, 50,000 feet and then 30,000 feet. And you don't necessarily get that whole um, continuous shot that I, I originally wanted. But I think that it, it was a pretty good visual, at least, that, that sort of goes along with everything. One of the big things that occurred, though, during this documentary making process was a, um, a lesson that every writer needs to know, every creative person that, that I certainly needed to learn, which is... Uh, kill all your darlings. If you ever hang out in writing circles or creative circles, you'll hear that phrase um, parroted a lot. And essentially, if you've never heard it before, what that means is if you have a darling thing that you feel very strongly about and you really want to write about this, you got to kill it because you oftentimes like put that where it doesn't necessarily need to go. And I had a couple of issues with making this documentary that, that sort of had that. One thing I really tried to do in the early phases of the script writing process was I wanted to have like two thirds of the way through, have it be this big reveal that Emily was the one behind Jin Air. Um, kind of like in the, the order of things that I discovered as I was doing all this research, I wanted to have it presented to the audience in the same sort of way. So for example, it would start off with like, talking about Han, talking about H-Dragon, early StarCraft, early teammate, early Jyn Air. And it w it w I would keep on bringing up the question of like, why does this team care so much? I don't know. And then, you know, another five minutes later, it's really weird, isn't it, that this team cares so much? That why does Jyn Air involved in esports? And then, you know, talk a bit about how involved Jyn Air is and say like, there must be somebody at Jyn Air that really cares about things so much. And then have it be a big reveal later on that, oh, it was this Korean heiress to a billion dollar fortune that was pulling all the strings behind behind the scenes. But I, I screen tested the documentary with a couple of people, um, a couple of patrons, shout out to you patrons, as well as my mom and my sister, actually. And they all sort of gave the, the feedback of like, you need to introduce Emily and, and this earlier. This feels like exposition that's, that needs to go at the first third of the documentary. It can't be so revealed so late. And uh, that, that was a very good feedback that, that definitely made the, made the documentary much better. The last thing conceptually that I still don't know how it, how it turned out is that um, one, one of my favorite YouTube creators is a guy named Dan Olson, Folding Ideas, that you should all go subscribe to if you aren't already. Um, he did a video that, that talked about a really funny, ridiculous movie um, 
what, what was the name of it? I'll put his video on, on screen right now and, and the, the movie as well. Um, but he, he did this video talking about this movie that this director made who um, the director slash writer worked on it for like 10 years. And he talked about how, you know, this movie is a great example of what happens if you rewrite the same script over and over and over ad infinitum, right? Like if, you, if you're just constantly rewriting something over and over until you become numb to the source material and you can't see how good or how bad it's getting. And th- this movie is a great example of that. And I, I feel like that happened to me a little bit in this documentary. I was constantly going through so many different research phases that I was, I was always having to rewrite the script. You know, I spent some time learning about the history of H-Dragon, the history of Jane Eyre, and then I was learning about the history of StarCraft, and I was like trying to contain all these different ideas into a single, a single script or a single outline at the very least in the early stages. But then I kept on learning more. I kept on learning how involved H-Dragon was, or I was learning about Emily Cho and and this whole new storyline I have to thread between everything. And the biggest worry I have for the documentary right now is that it it might have come off a little bit too piecemeal. It might have come off as like a, a bunch of individual thoughts that all sort of jump from one to another rather than a single continuous narrative that builds from beginning to end. And I don't know how it came across because I've been working on this documentary for so long that I have no idea if it, if it comes across well to you guys or not, um, because I'm kind of numb to the source material myself at this point. But I, I think it was definitely a very valuable experience for me to work on this. You know, I've talked a lot about how in recent years I've been trying to get better at making documentaries, get better at telling stories. And I think that the Jin Air documentary and the Khan documentary, the two most recent ones I've done are are the best documentaries I've made. And I would maybe say that the Khan documentary is better than the Jin Air documentary. It's a little bit more cohesive, has a little bit of a, you know, more continuous story and, and maybe a little bit more impactful for people. It might make you cry a little bit harder. But I think the Jin Air one might have been even more valuable because this was definitely the most challenging project. This was like a mixture of journalism and art. <laughs> you know, it, it was like half of this was telling a story, but half of this was trying to do all this research and learn all these things about this team that I don't think anybody even knows about. You know, I, I think that a lot of people, they, they might know bits and pieces of the Jin Air story, of the story of H-Dragon or Emily Cho, but a lot of people, especially outside of Korea, have no idea that H-Dragon exists or that that you know that that all of these important these important things belong to one big continuous narrative. So spending so much time working on this story and and constantly discovering these things and having to add them into the into the documentary and the narrative, it, it was a challenge. It was one of the more challenging documentaries I've ever had to make. And I I don't know how well it came across. Like it, it might not be the best thing I've made. I always want the most recent thing that I released to be the best thing I've ever done. But yeah, I mean, the, the con documentary might be a little bit better. But beyond that, I, I think it turned out very well. And, you know, it definitely has fa- it, it has flaws. It has faults. If I could go back and do it all at once, knowing the whole story from the beginning, I think I could have made it much better. But I think that it, it does have some, uh, at least I hope it has some charm. It, it has a, a, a really cool bit of charm that, you know, I don't know if any any other documentary that I've made or that other people have made on YouTube has that sort of unique flair that this one does. No matter what, it was certainly a, a very valuable experience for me in, in making it. And I, I'm I'm excited already to get, get to work on the next documentary project because I think that especially with both of these last two documentaries, they, they've been very, very rewarding experiences for me to work on and for me to build up and... and um, I hope they came across well to you guys because I'm, I'm having a lot of fun making them. Anyway, though, as I said, I will have another making of video on my Patreon. If you want to pledge a dollar, you can go watch that video uh, where I show you the outline and some of the scripts and give some more details in the actual structural structural building of this documentary. If you're interested in some of the the actual details instead of the wider scale concepts like this but even if you don't uh, thank you very much for watching this thanks for listening to my voice right now making it to the end of this video subscribe to this gbay 100 channel if you want to see more behind the scenes or laid back vloggy style content like this um i love making things for you guys and uh thank you very much for watching uh see you see you next time